to. Um, when we select properties here, <laughs> there are a, a defined set of flags for release versus active configuration. And in particular, I think if you look down here for the compiler, it lists all of the different flags for the release configuration. There's a whole set. A lot of them are different, include directories. But if, if you, the main one for debugging is, is this dash G flag that's included. And you'll see it down here, the dash G to this compiler means include the debug information in, in the executable. So you, you can change through this actual dialog window, you can, you can change you know, what the features of the various release or debug. I, I don't recommend that you do that. Let, let's just leave everything um, uh, to their default values. But that's essentially all that happened, is going on there is whether the uh, debug information is included in the, in the uh, final executable or not. Um, but <laughs> there are some other impl implications for us that so we can use different versions of printf. The default printf, the first one we used, we ran in debug mode, and that prints to the debug console. Displays to debug console. So if you're running a release version, you won't see anything at all. It only runs when you're running it uh, with the debugger attached. So, so that's fine. Now we've pretty quickly switched over to using another version of printf that actually prints to this serial terminal. So that you see in the terminal in Code Composer Studio or with Putty. Okay, that's that's there. That works. You don't have to be in be in debug mode. You can be just in release mode. We will eventually, when we hook up that little display, we'll reconfigure printf so that when we use it, it actually prints to that little LCD display we have to have in our parts kits. Um, but Another implication is in release mode, the compiler will perform optimizations. And normally that's a good thing, right? You can control the level of op optimization through a, through a flag that you pass to the, the compiler. So normally you think we want our code to be as optimized as, as possible, but that is not always desired. And I ran into this the other day with the code I gave you guys and then I sent out an email about it. So I thought I'd mention it. Um, so for example, the compiler actually is, is just trying to be a little too smart. So we have this delay routine that Counting up to you know some number. I have a hundred thousand here. It's going to give us some delay, and then you can put just a semicolon here. I usually put a pair of curly braces to emphasize that it's just got a blank body. There's no there's no body to this for loop. Okay. And so ideally, it would just run through this hundred thousand times, and then providing some sort of delay. Now in debug mode, that works fine. In release mode, when I compiled uh, for in release mode, it does various opti optimizations. There was no delay at all. It wasn't executing these lines of code. And the reason is this code doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't, 
from the compiler standpoint, it doesn't actually, it doesn't return any, it doesn't return a value. It doesn't it change any other registers or variables. So, you know, if you had this in your C programs on your desktop computers, you know, it essentially does nothing. So the compiler says, this does nothing, it affects nothing, I'm going to skip it. So it just optimizes it away, okay? So it's an example, in my opinion, of the compiler track, you know, it's trying to make your code faster, and it will certainly run faster, but we were specifically introducing this code uh, to introduce a delay. Okay, so, and you, you, can, you can try this, you know, switch over to release mode, that code we had last, last time, and the LED will always just stay on. You, you don't get the delay at all. So there is a little trick. Um, We can trick the compiler. Into keeping the code using the volatile keyword. So we declare I to be a volatile variable. And now the compiler will keep the code. Now, this is kind of a, a different use of the word volatile. Okay, so um, generally what volatiles intended for is, is actually our uh, like P1 n, ret, n value is actually a pointer to a volatile variable. And the reason for that is, you know, if you read that in your code, And then we do something, and then we read it again. An optimizing compiler would say, hey, this is a variable. It hasn't, you know, if I don't have any lines of code here that are modifying p1.n, the compiler will say, I've already read that. I'm not going to read it again. Okay. I've already copied that into a register. There's been no code to change it. Volatile would indicate, Mr. Compiler, you don't know everything. There are external things going on here that can modify this variable. And so if we declare it to be volatile, the compiler will say, okay, something else could possibly cause this to change. I'm going to have to reload the variable every time I read from it. Okay, does that make sense? So that could happen with like the end variable. Actually, most of the register variables that we access that can be that can actually be changed by external switches or or other inputs are declared volatile in our header files. Okay. And so we can trick the compiler here by saying, Mr. Compiler, you don't know everything. There may be something external that actually changes the value of the count here. So you can't do away with this loop. So you could try, I encourage you to try running this code we had last time with and, with, with and without that in release mode. And you'll see that without it, at least when I ran it, it, there's no delay. But then when you put the volatile keyword in there, you get the right delay. It works fine in debug mode because in debug mode, the compiler doesn't do these optimizations. So, but something like that can be pretty tricky to debug, to find a mistake like that. It's like, well, it runs fine under the debugger. It, it does not run in release mode. So sometimes these optimizations can, can 
invite you. Okay. Another thing is you want to be careful with uh, operator precedence. So I think I said something like this last time. Check if switch one is pressed. And remember, when we press switch one, it causes a low to be red. So you could do if P1 is less than N, I'm sorry, read, read the N value from port one. And then switch one was bit one. Okay, so if we end that, so we read that eight bit port value, and there could be other things connected there, right? That, so we could get one or zero and other regist and other bits. I don't care. I really just want to test the one bit. So this is going to mask off the other bits, give me zeros everywhere except in that one bit. If I want to test if it's pressed, um, let's say I have other code here. There's an error there. You know what the error is? I'll give you a hint a little earlier. Seems like it's going to do the right thing. Any, any guess as to what the error might be? The and? The, the, it's kind of correct. Okay. But the equal equal operator actually has a higher precedence than the and operator. So this is actually equivalent to Without any parenthesis, this is the same as, so, so let me put, someone's going to say, well, you had that on the board. So I'm going to put that on my, I'm gonna put, no, don't do that. Also, no, don't do this. You remember PEMDA, right, from was it middle school or high school where you learn, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally for operator press precedence in basic math? Something like that, right? These, they still teach PEMDA, PEMDAS, parentheses, exponentiation, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction is the order of the operators. Well, each of these little operators, like the and and the equal equal, also have precedence. That one is actually the equal equal has higher precedence than the and. So that, without parenthesis, this is what you're doing. This is the equivalent code. No, these are exclamation marks. Is two ever equal to zero? It is not. This will be false. Since we're ending, this will always be false. This code will never be executed. So it's, it's a subtle mistake. You have to really know your C to know that this has higher precedence than that. So how do we fix the problem and get it to do what we want? Use parentheses to enforce precedence. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so what you really want to do is make it do the AND and then compare the results of the AND other code. And this is what we want. So I guess, you know what they say about assuming. So you're assuming a certain precedence here that's incorrect. Never hurts to throw an extra parenthesis to enforce what you believe to be the precedence of the operators. But watch out for that, because that, that can be, you can scratch your head over that for a while and say, well, you know, maybe going into the debugger and then find out, well, it's never actually going into the body of, the, of your if loop, of your if loop, of your if decision structure. 
there. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the, the different documentation that we have available to us with this particular microcontroller and board and where it's documentation And the first is the Launchpad user guide. Now, remember, we're using a particular microcontroller. And, and you can go out and buy that microcontroller and put it on your own printed circuit board. We're using a particular development kit called this, this Launchpad, these, these red boards that have a lot of nice features on them. You know, the switches, the LEDs, you know, the, the USB connector, the, the virtual serial port, all of that stuff is really nice when we're trying to figure out how to use this microcontroller. But you might not want to include that if you're actually going to do some sort of production, if you're, if you're building your own uh, world-changing device, you know, your own MP3 player or something like that. You probably don't want to include uh, the switches and LEDs that are on this launch pad. But so the launch pad has all these features on it. There's documentation for the launch pad itself. Okay, so in the launch pad user guide, and you'll find this in Code Composer Studio. I really like one of the things I really like about Code Composer Studio is that the links it provides to all the documentation. So in this resource explorer, I'm going to abbreviate that RE. If you go into the kits and boards. Am I forgetting a step here? I'll have to look and see. And then the MSP 432P401R launch pad. So this has the documentation on the launch pad, on the board, which again is different than the microcontroller. So if you come into Resource Explorer, um, let me maximize this thing. Okay. And then resource, I think I uh, skipped the, the one item here. It should be development tools, then kits and boards. development tools. Kits and boards. You, you drill down in <coughs> down into the, the launch pad. And we've got here this this quick start start guide, which I think is unless you threw this away, this is the little Two, two page card that was included in the, in the board. Don't throw it away, it's, it's a nice reference. But the other thing is, is the Launchpad user's guide. Okay, that, that talks a lot about, you know, the launch, Launchpad, but you know, one of the questions you might have is, well, if they weren't in the book, you know, how would I find So this contains all the schematics for the board itself. You know, we talked about last lecture, lecture prior, that you know what port pens the LEDs and switches were connected to. Well, that information was in our book, but where would you find that if we didn't have the book? Well, it's in the board documentation, the launch pad, because these are extra features on the on the launch pad. Here's that tricolor LED, and it shows pretty clearly that the red LED is port two bit zero. Okay. And so over here are two switches. One is port one uh, bit four, and the other is bit, uh, port one bit one. Okay. And it's got documentation on you know, the reset button that's there, 
And then there are different headers on the board for accessing five volts and 3.3 volts. It's got six pages of schematics here. Okay, shows all the different headers and the lines connected to the different headers. One of the other things I wanted to point out, is this it? Because I'll talk about it in just a second. Just looking for should be two external crystals. Yeah, here they are. Also, there are connected, and these are on the launch board. On the launch pad, they're not internal to the microcontroller, but we've got these two, uh, what they call a low frequency crystal and a high frequency crystal that can be used to clock the microcontroller. And I'll talk more, about, but those are actually on the on the launch pad itself. Okay? They're not internal to the microcontroller. So in this launch pad user guide, that's where you go to find out you know, where are these switches and LEDs. How are they connected? Now, we also have the user guide for the microcontroller itself. And then there's also a, 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 date, what's a data sheet. The data sheet typically contains information about the maximum currents, you know, what range of voltages and temperatures, things like that, the microcontroller can withstand. But this is in the recess, uh, resource explorer, device documentation. And then MSP 432PXX because there are different variants of this, these, uh, of this microcontroller must be, that have different amounts of memory primarily, but we're using the MSP 432 P401. And I guess I'll also mention, you know, while you're here, you, you can download these things. I think it downloads them first time you access them uh, locally, but you can also download them to another directory that you can access a little more easily so that if you're not connected to the internet, you still have this documentation available. So outside the uh, device documentation. And then MSP 430. I've got uh, this filter set up, so it's only showing the information relevant to my particular launch pad, okay? Otherwise you get all this other documentation. But in the user's guide, this has everything you want to know and more about the microcontroller. It's a thousand and to say a thousand and fifty three pages long. So I'd like you to read through this by Monday. So this is this is one of the things that you know, difficult getting you know, microcontrollers are so complex. You know, you know, just be overwhelmed with this document. You know, printed out it's going to be four inches thick. But what have we been talking about? So, you know, this has got documentation on all the different parts of the microcontroller. We'll talk a little bit about the clock system that's here in chapter six. It's going to have, well, I want to talk about timers. Um, it's got documentation on all the timers. I keep scrolling uh, digital I.O. Or this is, this, this is in chapter 12. Okay, talks about digital I.O. Um, tells you in here, you know, this is where the author of our textbook got all of his information about, you know, for the input registers. Now you, when you read an input register, it reflects the value of the, the signal, you know, writing to the output registers. Uh, the direction register, you know, put a bit zero there, that makes it an input, right? Uh, a, a one to that particular a bit location it makes it an output. 
you remember, I had this same table on the board for when it's an input configuring pull up or pull down. So all this information, output drive strength, function selection registers, all of that information uh, is available in this particular document for, for each of these different subsections of this microcontroller. And again, it's, it's got a lot of built-in features. Um, here, if you scroll on down, you know, here are, um, you know, here are like the input and output registers and they're offset relative to the base address. So you can actually figure out what the real addresses are in the microcontroller using this documentation. And they, and they tell you their offsets relative to the base uh, address for the IO, but it's the input register, and then the output register, the direction register, all rel have different relative offsets. Um, one other thing I'll mention, let's see the software. Uh, in the software, there are various libraries that we're not using yet. One other thing that you can find documentation, certainly about uh, Code Composer Studio, integrated developer environments. There are different IDEs that are available. We're using Code Composer Studio. And then there's documentation about Code Composer Studio. I do intend to actually um, you know, have a, a session where we'll talk about debugging in Code Composer Studio. Uh, projects and build, documents, user guides here, TI compiler manuals. So there are two manuals here that completely describe the compiler, the C compiler, 210 pages long, and then another one completely describing the assembler. So I don't expect we'll be using the we kind of already covered assembly, but there's certainly a lot more information available in here um, on, on the different tools. But we will have, we'll probably be referencing the user's guide for the microcontroller um, at some point in the future. Okay, so the next subsystem about the microcontroller that I want to talk about <coughs> is the clock system. Just giving you an overview. And at this point, this is kind of like what we did with the UARTs to um, allow us to write to the terminal. You know, I'll provide you some code so that you can actually change the clock if you want to. You don't need to in this course. Okay. So the default clock is uh, the, the default bus clock. It, it, the microcontroller is running at three megahertz. Okay. So you guys may be familiar with um, overclocking your PC. What does that do for you? I have to speak up louder with the mask. I couldn't even say it was, I couldn't even tell you who was saying anything. Yes. It completes the task faster. Yeah, it, it causes the microprocessor to run faster, right? Are there any dangers to overclocking? Yeah, it produces a lot more heat. It uses a, it, it uses a lot more power which produces heat. So the danger of overclocking is you could actually burn up your processor. Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a processor generally for a computer system. They're generally not designed and meant to be clocked at other than the, the default clock rate. Sometimes manufacturers will sell microprocessors that can run at a higher clock rate and then they sell a cheaper version of the system just with a slower clock. But microcontrollers typically can run at a, a large range of clock rates because you, you continually have this power 
speed trade off. The faster you clock the system, the more power it uses. So if you were wanting to use this microcontroller in some application that was battery powered, and maybe you wanted to maybe you wanted it to last for months without replacing the battery. You, know, you can run it in a low speed, low power mode. Now, if you needed it um, to finish a task, it's going to be a lot slower in carrying out certain tasks. So if you have it doing a lot of computations, you may and you need to have those done in a certain amount of time, you may need to clock it at a higher rate. So there's constantly this how much power am I, am I using portable power? Am I going to be battery powered versus how fast do I need the thing to actually run to, to complete to complete the operations? Well, most microcontrollers have a very flexible clock system, and this one does as well. It has by default, it has an internal digital controlled oscillator or DCO uh, for variable clock speeds between 1.5 and 48 megahertz. So a fairly wide range of possible clock speeds. Uh, so you can choose to run at the lower clock speed or the higher clock speed. Um, the author of your textbook, of your textbook in this particular section, he, he provides just simple routines like we have in our UART system to change the, the clock speed based on this uh, digital controlled oscillator. So and I'll, sh I'll show you the driver program in just a few minutes okay, and how you can use that if, if you want to. We won't really, I don't think, have a need to do this. The default clock speed, so when you turn it on, is three megahertz. By default, when you turn it on, it's going to use this digital controlled oscillator. It's an internal, based on an internal uh, timing device, and it runs at a default of three megahertz. Okay. You, can, you can change it. Now, another issue with this, though, is this isn't a high accuracy clock. I think it has a precision of like uh, plus or minus half a percent. So if you need it in a really an application where you need to do really accurate timing, running it off this digital control oscillator may not be sufficient. So on the launch pad, remember I showed you that there's different crystals. The launch pad provides as high accuracy Uh, a fairly slow clock, 32 kilohertz, low frequency. XT is the standard abbreviation you'll, you'll see for, for crystal clock. And a 48 megahertz calls the high frequency crystal clock crystals. So these are available on the, externally on the launch pad itself. And so you can choose to use these to clock, to, to run your, uh, run the microcontroller using clocks based off of these external crystals. Okay, you can use the digital controlled oscillator to run at 48 megahertz, or you can use this external crystal. Now this one, you, you can't change it. It's 48 megahertz, only 48 megahertz. You know, why would you use this one over that one? This one is much more accurate will allow you much more precise timing than you can get with a digital controlled oscillator. Uh, so routines
to change the clock. And I put all these up on the website or in this clock system.c file. And we'll, we'll just take a look at it. Um, so under today's lectures. And so what you can do with clock system.c and clock system.h, put, the, put these in the same directory that your UART files are in. So we can link to those if you want to use them. Again, we won't, I don't think we'll be using them. But the clock system.c provides it. We're not going to get into, you know, all he's doing here is setting various bits and various registers associated with the clock system. And he's got different routines for uh, initializing the clock. This is using the internal digital controlled oscillator or uh, switching it over to use the external 48 megahertz clock or the external 32 kilohertz clock. And so drop these into your, your source directory, and then you cr could create a new project that <clears throat> um, it's just a driver program to test out those routines. And all this is doing is toggling on and off the blue LED. So if you could uncomment, by default it's using three megahertz, but if you uncomment this, it's going to run at 12 megahertz, and the, the LED should flash four times as fast. Um, I think I've got this one running right now. Um, or you could choose to run it at 48 megahertz using either the internal digital controlled oscillator or the external crystal, and it will run 16 times faster. There, right? 16 times faster than the default 3 megahertz. So it has that feature that's available. The other thing that you can do, well, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and, and do this. Um, so if you bring up Code Composer Studio, so here's how you would do that. Let's see, I'll, I'll create a new new project and I'll call it L17 clock system and it actually, I had it create a main for me, but I don't, I've got another, the test, the clock driver has a, a main routine, so I'm just going to delete this. You can't have two mains in your project. Uh, the linker will complain. But now, back here, I want to download the, the main program. Back into this project I just created. And then the support routines, I want to download those into the, what I call it, EE354 source. And then the header file needs to go there as well. The same directory. Now, back here, I need to add those files then into this project. And I, I'm just recommending you put these, these files you may use over and over again in the E354 source. Okay? You, you certainly will probably never have to include these clock files again, but add files now. And then in the E354 source, this particular project requires both the the C code for the functions as well as the header file. And I'm, go I'm going to link to them as opposed to, to copying them over. And you see in the, in the clock system file where it includes this header, 
and then it also calls some routines in there. And you can, um, or these are the routines in the main program is where you can actually play around with commenting and uncommenting different blocks. Initially here, it's set up by default to use the three megahertz plug. So any questions about that? Doing this. What you will be doing, what you will may want to do even for this project is in the next section, he talks about uh, a timer. It's a 32-bit timer called the system tick timer or the sys tick timer. And um, it's really easy to use. It's a hardware-based timer. So it's going to be more accurate than the software delay loops that we've been using for like half a second delay. And I don't care which you use for, for this project. And, and, um, this particular microcontroller, I think, has six different timers on it. Uh, but all the Cortex-M microcontrollers have this six SysTick timer. So if you use it, you know, your, co your code's fairly portable among the, the, the different microcontrollers. Now, in, the, in the, the same thing here, we have code we want to um, put into our source directory. Let me create a, uh, a new project. I've got, got a dry, and this is really easy to use. So I'll show you in just a second. L17 sys. Timer. And again, I had it do it with a main, but that's not. Um, and then now back on my. When it, this is just an example program that uses it. This is the timer save. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll switch over to the release version, and it doesn't matter. Uh, it's compiling. Uh, so I had errors here, and I think the main errors I have. Um, Two errors. I forgot to include those support files in the project. So I want to add those. This uses the two SysTick, the source code and the header. I want to link them. Okay. Try recompiling now. I was thinking it might complain because I left the main in here, and so I've got two main programs. So I was thinking it might compile when it complain when it. Um, yeah, it's giving me main redefined errors. So that's what you get if you have two main programs, two move two main routines in your project. So, right one more time. So if, if you take a look at this C code, it's, it's not too hard to, to set up the SysTick timer. You have to initialize it, and then you can uh, have a wait routine that waits in terms of clock cycles. Now the wait here is going to depend on um, what your clock frequency is. You know, if you're on the three megahertz, on the three megahertz clock, if delay is Three million, that's a one second delay. If you're using, now this is a 32 bit quantity, so you can't actually, unsign 32, so you can't actually get above four billion. So the maximum you could get with that 30, the three megahertz there is, is, is a delay of approximately four seconds here because the integer value that you pass will be greater than that. But 
Um, so just use SysFix wait to get a, a delay in clock cycles. A little more convenient to use is in 30,000 30, with that three megahertz clock is going to be a 10 millisecond delay. So this is actually just giving you multiple 10 millisecond delays. So you call this routine SysTick wait 10 milliseconds. If you call it with 100, that would be a one second delay. And it just calls this 10 millisecond. Is that right? 100, 10 milliseconds times, yeah, with 100 would give you a one second delay. So in, in, the, in the driver program, all that you need to do is include the sysTick.h header, initialize the timer, and then this is going to give a hardware-based half-second delay. So, and it's just toggling the blue LED every time. So if I write this out now to the microcontroller, So we'll come back and, and one of the things we will cover in a future chapter is, is actually how to use these timers in, in some detail because um, uh, they are quite useful. But then this, this gives the, uh, should be approximately a half second delay for it's on for half a second and off for half a second. And then if, if I change this from 50, the 200, so I have to recompile. It should now be what a, a two second delay, right? Two seconds on, two seconds off. Um, <clears throat> it, one of the things I didn't mention about the clock is there's also a, like a nine kilohertz clock, a really, really low power clock. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you switch from the three megahertz in the software delay to that nine kilohertz clock, uh, and you, at three megahertz you're, you're waiting for half a second with a software delay, that, that turns out to be minutes with the nine kilohertz clock. It, it's a long time. And then so so now this is still flashing at the half a second. It should take just a. Um, seconds to download. Is it slowed down yet? Okay. It should be roughly now two seconds on, two seconds off. That what it's doing. Yeah. So you can use these routines for, for hardware based time. Okay, that's it. Have, uh, see a lot of you in about an hour. Wow. Not three ten. How do we do I <laughs> <laughs>